you want to use identity awareness in R75 checkpoint firewalls, here is an example. Before you even start to configure identity awareness, save yourself a lot of pain and make sure your GUI client desktop is logged into the domain you want to authenticate against. If you do that, all your AD information will just pop right up for you, making this simply an exercise in point and click. If your AD authentication is working, when you connect, you should get a successful response. This is actually enough to be up and running, but let's take a look at a few options that you should consider specific to your deployment and use of identity awareness. Under the Identity Awareness tab in your firewall object, check your Active Directory settings. You should see a listing of your Active Directory domains and some additional parameters. Take note if your user should only ever be logged in on one machine at a time. You can limit that requirement here. In the Advanced tab, you can exclude users, machines, and networks from being authenticated, for example, to prevent an administrator account to authenticate or prevent user-level access from a server-class machine. The R75 gateways are capable of sharing identity information with other checkpoint gateways. You could designate only a couple of gateways to collect user information and share it with the others to limit the amount of information queried from the AD servers or to reach gateways that can't directly access Active Directory. And if you are using a proxy for your web browsing but still want to associate user information with the traffic, you can configure a special header to be forwarded in the proxy with a username so unique identities are still known to the firewall. For users not authenticated against the domain, you can still identify them using a captive portal. Some key settings to be aware of. Make sure and define a portal address that is reachable by the users. You can direct users by a domain name, just make sure it resolves to the gateway IP that is hosting the captive portal. You can import a certificate to avoid those pesky cert errors in the browser as the authentication of the user in the captive portal happens over SSL. Lastly, make sure you've defined all the interfaces that need access to the portal. By default, the portal is only seen by the internal interfaces. If you have users on the DMZ, for example, you have to explicitly allow the access. In this configuration, I'm going to allow guest access. When I have visitors over, they can simply log in as a guest for access to the network. You can present a user agreement or write your own. Define any fields you want the guests to fill out, and if it is mandatory information to provide. Now back in our application policy, let's define some user-based rules instead of using objects. For our source, we will select to add user access roles. The user access role object has three specific values for us to define. First off, the network they are on. This limits what networks are allowed to host authenticated users. Your local objects list is available to you for selection. Next, we have the option to define the users, whether it's all users, only ones seen by the domain, or potentially limited by various groups defined within your Active Directory. The last field definition we need to worry about is for specific machines. You can limit authenticated users to come from only machines that are known to the domain and already registered there. In this example, I'm creating a rule to track users from domain administration machines within my network. Give your access role object a name and you're ready to go. Keep in mind this object can be reused throughout the policy. Now we'll select an application that requires authentication to use. Say something like, I don't know, Facebook? Set our action to accept. Then make sure to edit the properties. This is where we define the use of the captive portal in the event we don't already know who the user is on the domain. Once we are done, we will install the policy to activate our new settings and turn on identity awareness. Once policy is in place, looking at your log should tell you if you are authenticating users properly across the domain. There is a pre-configured log filter for viewing authentication events. Look under the Identity Awareness tab. You should see entries like this showing user, IP, and machine name. You will also see identity source comes from AD. Let's take a look at the user experience from the perspective of somebody on the domain. As you can see, this user is actually logged into the domain. 
And since they're already known on the domain, they're known to the firewall, which means their browsing experience to Facebook is pretty much how they would expect it. Now let's jump over to another user's machine who is not on the domain. This computer is on the same network as the last one, however it is not logged into the domain. When this user attempts to access Facebook, they will be stopped and prompted for username and password. Since we allow guest access, this user can log in by just providing a name and optionally an email address. After acknowledging the terms of service, they can continue on as normal. Since we now know who they are, there's no need to bother them with the captive portal again, meaning other rules you create will also apply. Since they are a guest user, they will appear a little differently in the identity access logs. You will see the information they put into the captive portal login, as well as being flagged as an unauthenticated guest. You can use identity access roles in the captive portal across your entire checkpoint policy, including the traditional rule base. With this option, you have the ability to create rules based on people and their roles, not just an IP address in the network. Hopefully this guide has helped you evolve your security infrastructure in a more user-friendly one, and save yourself some late-night change windows in the process.